Hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's congressional briefing, Promoting Innovation and Delivery of Cell and Gene Therapies. I'm Cynthia Benz, and I serve as Senior Vice President of Public Policy at the Personalized Medicine Coalition, or PMC. PMC is made up of more than 220 members in the healthcare space, including patients, patient advocacy organizations, large and small diagnostic companies, biopharmaceutical companies, research and clinical care institutions, health IT companies, and other strategic partners. We're all working together to accelerate a paradigm shift to personalized medicine, which we define as an evolving field where diagnostic tests are used to determine which medical treatments will work best for each patient, or where physicians use medical interventions specifically to alter molecular mechanism that impact that person's health. We feel that personalized medicine holds great potential for reducing trial and error approaches to care by better aligning treatment and prevention plans with data from patients' diagnostic tests, that individual's medical history, circumstances, and their values. In an effort to successfully position the field of personalized medicine to positively impact patient outcomes and reduce inefficiencies in care, PMC's activities span public education, evidence development, policy, and advocacy. In 2019, PMC's advocacy inspired the formation of the bipartisan, bicameral, Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus, whose members seek to ensure that healthcare policies taken up by Congress consider personalized medicine. Since its launch in early 2020, the caucus has partnered with PMC and its allies to host educational briefings about the importance of advancing personalized medicine for the benefits of patients in the healthcare system. We're thankful that cell and gene therapy is an area the caucus wanted to explore because it is an important and growing um, component of personalized medicine. In the most basic sense, cell therapy is the transfer of intact live cells into a patient to help lessen or cure a disease. Gene therapies seek to modify or manipulate the use of um, gene to alter biological properties of living cells for therapeutic use. The American Society of Gene and Cell Therapy releases a quarterly report on cell and gene therapy development. In their most recent report published in the fourth quarter of 2021, they found that there are 19 gene and cell therapies like chimeric antigen receptor therapies or CAR-T currently approved for clinical use globally and nearly 2000 gene and cell therapies in various stages of testing. They also reported that oncology and rare diseases are some of the most commonly targeted therapeutic areas for development. In February of this year, Dr. Carl June, the University of Pennsylvania immunologist who designed the first CAR-T treatment, stated that we are able to conclude that CAR-T cells can actually cure patients based on 10-year follow-up data for the first patients who received this treatment. There's no doubt that the field is in an exciting place, but unfortunately, their novel nature, associated costs for both the therapies and their delivery, uncertainty about the lasting impacts of some of these treatments on patient health, and existing inequities in our healthcare system create regulatory reimbursement and access barriers for patients. With the help of Congress and the tireless efforts of the wonderful folks you'll be hearing from in a few minutes on the panel, many of these barriers can be overcome. Um, I'm actually gonna move um, to the panel discussion um, a little sooner than we expected. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna ask our esteemed speakers to turn on your cameras and then mute your microphones. Um, and joining us for today's discussion are Stephanie Dyson, Vice President and Head of U.S. Public Policy and Government Affairs for Bristol Myers Webb, Dr. Brian Kaufman, Co-Founder and Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer of the CLL Society, Dr. Michael Sherman, Executive Vice President and Chief Medical Officer for Point32 Health, Ashley Valentine, the Co-Founder and President of Six Cells, and Lowell Zeta, a partner with the firm Hogan Levels. Welcome. Um, so I'll start by asking each of you to take a few minutes to introduce yourselves and your organization, offer some opening remarks on the current state of the field of cell and gene therapy, and share your thoughts on how cell and gene therapies are changing patient care. Um, Dr. Kaufman, would you like to kick things off and um, make your introductions and opening remarks, please? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this opportunity to share information about the particular needs of those, and I'm gonna be speaking personally about those with chronic lymphocytic leukemia or CLL, but also others with chronic diseases uh, with this important caucus. In the way of introduction, I'm a retired family doctor and clinical professor, now turned patient, and I've dedicated myself to teaching and helping the CLL community since my own aggressive CLL diagnosis back in 2005. 
I believe my dual status as a retired physician and as a patient provides a unique perspective on, in terms of my experience and understanding, which allows me to provide clear explanations of complex issues and to advocate for my fellow patients and to inform my fellow healthcare providers. This is especially important in view of the rapidly changing therapeutic landscape with more targeted and new cellular therapies in blood cancers and cancers in general. The timing of my diagnosis and treatment was fortuitous. In 2015, ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, named the transformation of CLL treatment as the cancer advance of the year. In order to ensure others had the same benefits of advanced care and one didn't need a doctoral degree to access the latest and most precise care, I co-founded with my wife and serve now as the Chief Medical Officer and Executive Vice President of the nonprofit CLL Society. The CLL Society is an inclusive, patient-centric, physician-curated nonprofit organization that addresses the unmet needs of those with CLL through patient education, advocacy, support, and research. On a personal note, I'm here because of my successes with two early phase one uh, trials, including most recently an experimental cellular gene therapy, CAR-T. CAR-T therapy was, has given me four good years in counting, and I'm eager to ensure that others may enjoy the same kind of benefits I have by being an early adapt, adopter of these new precision and cellular therapy methods. Thank you so much, Dr. Kaufman. We're so fortunate to have you uh, with us today and have you on this panel. We, we look forward to hearing more about your perspective. Um, Ms. Valentine, would you like to go next? Sure. My name is Ashley Valentine. I'm co-founder and president of Six Cells. The other co-founder is my brother, Marcus Valentine. He lived 36 years with sickle cell disease. He passed away in 2020. And we came together to form a nonprofit that eliminates stigma associated with sickle cell disease and influences decision makers. And our primary mission is to empower people living with sickle cell disease to share their stories, but then also help those people make sure the stories are heard by, by individuals that can make change. So when we say decision makers, that means policy makers, that means hospital administrators, that means school teachers, state legislators. And this, this mission was born out of myself working as a policy researcher in DC and my brother living this life with sickle cell disease and also seeing how the landscape was changing. And in all of his years of being alive, we were seeing the same disparities happen. And so we came together and said, something has to change. And so while changing hearts and minds with the stories, we also think it's important to change policy to offer protections for the sickle cell disease community. And the arrival of gene and cell therapies, of curative therapies, it's really giving this patient population hope that there will be a shift in the way society thinks about sickle cell disease. But also, I think it is giving the healthcare system an opportunity to reset. There have never been curative therapies like this before. And because of that, society and these, these systems at play need to change, and we have to change because the current systems that are in place, thinking about payment, thinking about uh, access and prescribing, those won't work for curative therapy. So it has put us in a position now where we absolutely have to come together to come up with better solutions. And we see this as an opportunity for us to reshape how healthcare is delivered for, for the broader community and for the sickle cell disease community. Thanks so much, Ashley. We're really um, fortunate to have you join today. And we have over 180 um, individuals on the line. Uh, so for those who aren't familiar with you and with Marcus's story and with your organization, um, we have no doubt that, that you will change some, some minds by the end of the panel. So thanks again. Um, uh, Ms. Dyson, would you like to go next? Absolutely. Um, good morning, all. I'm so grateful to be joining everyone on the panel and my colleagues. And I appreciate the partnerships with advocates like Dr. Kaufman and Ashley, really to enable broader patient access to innovative therapies. I say that because I'm a registered nurse by background. Um, I work for Bristol Myers Squibb and here I lead the US policy and government affairs team. And so like Dr. Kaufman, I have a particular affinity for uh, this company because of our positioning with innovative therapies and keeping patients at the center of everything we do. On a personal level, um, 
with respect to oncology and especially blood cancers, my father passed away of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so I always sort of jump at the chance to ensure that we're in, uh, trying to keep patients and access at the forefront of what we do. At BMS specifically, we're uniquely situated to talk about transformative potential of cell therapies. We're the only company with two approved CAR T cell therapies directed against two distinct targets of diseases, including the first ever approved CAR T therapy in multiple myeloma, which is a BECMA. And of course, I'm excited about the transformative potential in these novel therapeutic modalities, um, which is quite frankly driven by single administration potential, disease modifying potential, and the high science that's involved, because that in and itself really has the ability to change patient care as we really think about keeping the patients at the center. The growth opportunities for cell and gene therapies really lie in the potential for us as a community to reach more patients and patients in varied settings. We need to think about treating a greater variety of disease types, as Ashley stated, reaching patients earlier in the course of their disease. And I'm proud to state that here at BMS, we've been able to reach nearly 3,000 clinical and commercial patients globally. And then lastly, we're just confident in our ongoing collaborations and our ability to evaluate the next generation and the allogeneic cell therapy and quite frankly, expanding our footprint and also something that I hope we discuss the digital platforms in this area. Thanks, Cynthia. Great. Thank you. And thank you so much for um, sharing your, your personal story with cancer. I know um, we've all been touched by it and I think drives a lot of uh, the reasons why we're, we're involved in this space. Um, Absolutely. I'm so fortunate for what you all are doing. Um, Dr. Sharma, would you like to go next? Yes, hi. Um, and again, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Michael Sherman. I'm Chief Medical Officer of the Payer Community, which uh, is not um, a well-known name because it's a name we're, we use having brought together Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare and Tufts Health Plan. But we do serve over 2.3 million members in Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial. And uh, I'm really deeply humbled following uh, some people you've heard who are working for companies that are developing transformative therapies or who have survived life-threatening conditions that they would not have had in the past. So, you know, I'm happy to be here. I, I do think health plans are part of the solution here because if we can't figure out how to make these therapies available to those who need them, um, they're not going to help. And the issue is that we suffer from um, a financing system for healthcare in this country, which isn't quite as innovative as the scientific advances. So we have a last decade, last century, and actually last millennium um, healthcare financing system, which never contemplated one-time therapies that might have high upfront costs, but might be worth it um, if we can figure out how to pay for them. Uh, my own organization was so concerned that we put together a separate clinical innovation area so we can actually test things and be early adopters and find ways to partner with the companies behind these advances. And it's that applies to cell and gene therapies and applies to many areas of precision medicine and cancer testing, et cetera. Um, there are so many areas that are that where the advances are there and they're coming soon, but we're not equipped to, to deal with them as payers. And if we don't deal with them, either payers sometimes have knee-jerk responses of making them hard to get access to which is not where we want to be. Again, it's easy to, to forget, and that's why I'm so happy to see colleagues here. It's about the patient. That, that's what is essential. If we, we ever can't determine what the right decision is, that's what I would remind my colleagues of. So it's, it, it really um, is important to make those available. But on the other hand, and we know this as a payer, um, if we can't figure out how the finances work and people can't afford healthcare, can't afford insurance, um, that's also a barrier. So we see ourselves playing a crucial role and certainly by being open to collaboration and really having a true north of doing the right thing, we think we're in a position to make a difference. So again, thank you for having us. And I welcome the opportunity to do a deeper dive in some of these topics. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Sherman. And I know you're often quoted as saying that the issue with this space is um, how do you cover them? How do you say no to them? And I love that. And I feel like that's something that we need to um, put on a bumper sticker and send out to, to everyone else in, in the payer community and, and a lot in government. Um, so, uh, Mr. Zeta, would you like to um, 
to round out our introduction, please. Sure, thanks. Good morning, colleagues and, and district members of the caucus. I'm Lowell Zeta, I'm a partner in the regulatory and life sciences practice um, at Hogan Levels in Washington, DC. And, and I have the privilege of, of working with developers from innovative startups um, to academic institutions to multinational biopharma companies to develop, obtain FDA approval and, and market um, innovative transformative medicines, um, including especially uh, cell and gene therapies aimed at treating serious and life-threatening diseases. And, and thank you for the opportunity to share my perspective on the current state of play um, and, and what more we could be doing with respect to promoting innovation for, for these therapies. In part, my, my perspective is informed from my time at FDA where I served as senior counselor to the then FDA commissioner, um, focusing on, on agency-wide priorities, including um, the ongoing pandemic. And, and, and there, I witnessed firsthand how FDA and other public health agencies and industry stakeholders um, came together to, to really ensure we were doing everything possible to protect the American public um, from facilitating development of diagnostics and the vaccines to addressing food supply shortages. Um, and, and I believe lessons made necessary from the pandemic um, helped to sort of reimagine how to realize the full potential um, of, of these really tra the transformative medicine, medicine some, some of the most um, innovative um, in recent times. And, and there are so many individuals with, with hereditary acquired diseases that could potentially benefit from, from treatment that's very much within reach. Um, and, and so as Cynthia was mentioning, um, in terms of the number of approvals and the number of clinical trials underway, that, that sort of sustained number um, has continued as an increase with, with FDA receiving more than uh, 200 IND submissions each year, including this past year. Um, and and FDA, FDA previously estimated approving you know, 10 to 20 cell and gene therapies um, by, by 2025. So, so the, the agency, the industry more broadly, um, is really at a, a critical inflection point. Um, um, in addition to, to sort of the initial focus on oncology, we're, we're seeing um, the therapies being tested and developed in, with respect to neurology, bleeding disorders, and, and rare diseases. Um, and so there's a tremendous opportunity um, to treat hundreds of thousands of patients in, in the US alone. And, and one area I just wanted to, to highlight quickly and happy to discuss um, 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 and unpack um, uh, later on in, in, in the discussion is, is that you know, FDA Center for Biologics, CBRS, is at a critical juncture in terms of um, the, 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 how the program regulates um, um, biological products and, and specifically with respect to the review um, of cell and, and gene therapy submissions. Um, one program, specifically the INTERACT program, which is really critical for early interactions with sponsors to sort of validate development programs, establish markers, really sort of create a value proposition. Um, and, and that's been impacted certainly by um, um, priorities with respect to um, the ongoing pandemic. Um, but that along with you know, other, other priorities in, in general, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the sort of increase and in, in sustained increase of submissions um, ha has impacted the ability to, um, to, to hold, hold these meetings um, um, in a time that's really critical um, to support innovators. So it's really critical that, that FDA and the center have these necessary resources um, to prioritize and, and build out staff to, to, um, to, to help drive, um, um, you know, and, and, and ultimately um, allow for access to these, these innovative medicines. So I look forward to sharing additional thoughts and, and learning and listening to, to my colleagues here today. Great, thank you so much. Um, so um, Ashley and, and Dr. Kaufman, you both um, touched a bit on your um, individual experiences with um, CLL and, and sickle cell disease in your intro. Um, but can you tell us a little bit more about um, your personal connections to the diseases and how they've shaped your views on the pace of clinical adoption of cell and gene therapy? And um, Ashley, let's start with you if that's okay. Sure, that's no problem. Um, so I think it's really important to highlight where I am in terms of, of family order for sickle cell disease. So I, I'm a sibling. I'm the youngest sibling, in fact, to someone living with sickle cell disease. And why that's important is because sometimes I get bucketed into the caregiver category, and that's just not the case. I 
was alongside my brother for a lot of his his journey, but I really took the role of observing. Wherever my parents went, I followed. Wherever, whenever there was a discussion about healthcare, I was there, but I was watching and also very, very close to my brother um, through his journey with sickle cell disease. So essentially I was raised in the healthcare system. And so I've watched a disease where the diagnosis itself carries these social consequences. And what I mean by social consequences, it is a disease that impacts a lot of Black people, a lot of Hispanic people. And we've seen through this pandemic that there is a great disparity in access to healthcare and how healthcare impacts these populations differently. Um, you know, my parents did used to have to fight every day for my brother's care and the things that were said to us by not only, you know, people in our in family or school, but at, and the healthcare systems that those you were really barriers to to care. Um, but what I also think is important is that I have watched how what it looks like going from no treatment options blossoming into four treatment options and this idea that a gene therapy, a curative therapy is to market, you know, that's really exciting. Um, so an idea of what this looks like when we were growing up, we used to have this huge medicine cabinet. It, it almost was like a refrigerator because we didn't have one treatment or one pill or one therapy to treat sickle cell disease. So we kind of joke, it was, if you give a mouse a cookie, you'd have to give them, you know, a medicine with a side effect and then another mm -hmm. medicine to treat the side effect. So the easiest example I can give are the blood transfusions given to people with sickle cell to prevent stroke and prevent pain crises. Um, growing up, my brother was on chronic blood transfusions, but that also leads to iron overload. And so to reduce or prevent iron overload, you then have to take a chelator and the chelator binds the iron in your blood and removes it from your body. So at the time when we were growing up, it was an overnight infusion. And so my mom would you know, prepare this infusion, sort of like how families share dinner, we would share the nightly chelators together and she would draw up all the medication and would poke my brother in the hip and he would spend overnight with this chelation infusion. Mm -hmm. In my lifetime, it's gone from a infusion with a pump driver to a powder that didn't really mix well, but it, it still was a powder that mixed in water that you drank, which increased compliance because now it's drinkable to now it's a pill and sprinkles. So mm -hmm. small children can sprinkle it in applesauce and eat it. Adults, adolescents can swallow a pill and it removes the iron from their body. And some of the people growing up, even, you know, we have small sickle cell on staff has never seen these, these chelators that I'm talking about with the, with the pump infusion. So that's what I mean about the hope um, that this brings to the community to think that there are curative therapies. But what I said earlier is that I do think now is an opportunity for us to, to shift how people are going to get these therapies and bringing this experience, um, my experience to the table here, I think, you know, we'll really be able to work with government and work with, with, with CMS specifically on shaping how to ensure that we create models to increase access to curative therapies and make sure that these treatments become available for people living with sickle cell. That's amazing. And, you know, our hope is that um, the complexity of these products are, are not something that stands in the way of um, it, it making meaningful changes in people's lives. Um, Dr. Kaufman? Yeah, on a personal level, um, I was able, because, as being a physician and living near tertiary centers and having access uh, to a sophisticated access to the internet, to able to find the best possible cares. But as our board of directors at the nonprofit says, you know, the, the low hanging fruit in chronic lymphocytic leukemia and in a lot of other cancers as Ashley spoke to and a lot of other chronic diseases as Ashley spoke to is ensuring that everyone knows about the revolutions that are happening. And one of the things that still breaks my heart is to see patients getting therapy that are now a decade out of being cutting edge of being appropriate for them. So as precision medicine advances and as cellular therapies become an option and hopefully move closer uh, to the time of diagnosis and not kind of as an end of the line treatment that I'll talk about a little later, I'm excited 
Uh, and I see one of our biggest goals is to educate not only the patients about these options that are out there, but frankly, a lot of healthcare providers who are often so overwhelmed with the pace of innovation that they're not up to date in terms of what the latest therapeutic options are. They're not up to date on what appropriate testing needs to be done to make sure that their patients are getting the right care. So this is one of the things that we're constantly uh, pushing for. Um, is uh, we, You quoted uh, Dr. Carl June at the beginning, and he likes to say uh, cellular and gene therapy is a 20-year overnight sensation. <laughs> and and uh, But still the reality is commercially available CAR-T therapies, this is really the first generation that's been shown to have a favorable efficacy and toxicity profile with dramatic results. And these are not exclusively, but often in patients that have really run out of options. These are patients uh, that are um, really uh, at the end of the line. We're still very early in the development, but the future is uh, full of promise. The options of using off-the-shelf CAR-Ts from others and outside or allogeneic source, such as umbilical cords, could allow quicker dosing, uh, um, which is often needed with acute leukemias, which can accelerate it frightening paces. And it may often, and it may even allow for booster doses, which are, are being considered. And as the genetic engineering advances, CAR-Ts can be sculpted to have uh, fewer adverse events and at the same time be more effective, uh, better targeted, even have more than one target, can be more durable, longer lasting. All of this leads to improved outcomes. As I said, CAR-T are often uh, seen as a last ditch Hail Mary pass when the patients in their T cells that are being harvested and genetically re-engineered are badly beaten up and less ready to do the work needed of them. So as CAR T therapy improves, I think it can become an outpatient uh, option. Such trials are happening now. I, I participated in one four years ago. And cellular therapy can move sooner up in the treatment uh, protocols. This easier approach would democratize access and allow it to be used outside of major tertiary centers assuming appropriate resources and training was in place. That's what my hope is, and I, I see that coming in the near future when we have the proper systems in place to allow it. Amazing. Um, Ms. Dyson, um, so in your introduction, you touched a bit on um, what um, Bristol Myers Squibb has been doing and, and what a leader you all are in the cell and gene therapy space. Um, would you like to say a little bit more about some of the areas where um, you've been um, thoughtful about pursuing these types of approaches? And also, um, you give us a sense of what some of the roadblocks are um, that you and others in the industry face, um, just bringing a, a cell and gene therapy through regulatory review all the way into patient care. Um, you know, are there particular shortcomings that um, we should be aware of related to our existing and coverage um, reimbursement structures that, that we have at a national level that should change? I, I think I'll start, and thanks for the question. I'll start by just commenting on Dr. Kaufman's statement that truly, despite the number, the growing number of cell and gene therapies reaching patients today, we're really just in the early days of witnessing the potential of these modalities. And to build on the foundation, what BMS scientists are doing that we're leveraging one of the largest data sets of CAR-T translational data and clinical data in the industry with one goal. And that goal is how do we use the learnings to help develop the new medicines? How do we help a broader population of patients with hematological disease, as Dr. Kaufman stated earlier in their course of disease? And interestingly, Lowell, you stated that FDA was at a critical inflection point. And so if you think about the complexity of delivering CAR-T therapy, um, it's unlike any other traditional biological medicine. And so FDA's mission is protection, but we also need to ensure that with that regulation comes a sense and a commitment to innovation. Um, the fact that we're using a patient's own cells to start a highly sophisticated and personalized manufacturing process, how do we ensure that FDA has what they need to keep up with this type of science and technology? And in addition to solving just not regulatory, but financial robots, how do we ensure there's a sufficient supply of the medicine to meet the needs of the patients and the challenge that we have with manufacturing? And at BMS, we're continuing to evolve every single day addressing these challenges head on. 
And again, we're applying our key learnings at our state of the art facilities. We have three of them. We have two other facilities that are in progress. And then regarding CMS, um, absolutely there are opportunities. Two years ago, CMS, we're grateful, took their first step, um, important step, quite frankly, to create a new DRG, diagnosis related group, um, to which CAR T and cell therapies could specifically map. And this has just constituted a paradigm shift in the inpatient patient, inpatient Medicare payments for CAR T, and it's improved the payment significantly. But we can't stop there. Like we really have to stay on CMS and ensure that they know that it's imperative that we have sustained adequacy of payments um, for CAR T. Any potential erosion um, in this payment could adversely risk and the patient access and have a chilling effect on this. Just think about what Ashley stated with the key later. What if that new therapy that came to market, we didn't have the ability for patients to have access to it? And so for this promise to be upheld for these investigational therapies and for our promise to be fulfilled, I would say from a CMS perspective that um, sustained access and payment adequacy is not only critical, but I would uh, sort of sequence that as number one A and one B, if you will. Great, and I think that tees us up nicely to um, some lull about some of the um, uh, issues that may be more helpful to industry um, and to FDA to overcome some of the challenges um, with where we're at with regulation of um, cell and gene therapies. And then we'll um, kick it over to Dr. Sherman to talk a bit about um, how the payment landscape needs to change. Uh, but Lowell, would you like to go first and talk a bit about what industry and FDA needs? Sure, great. And and um, thanks so much for the um, colleagues' insights. Uh, um, really, really sort of helpful and, and kind of fill into a couple of the area, a few of the areas that I wanted to highlight today. So that there, there are three key areas that that um, I wanted to kind of um, tee up um, um, that I think are, are critical for promoting innovation delivery of, of um, cell and gene therapies going forward, and especially where I think members of the Hill play a really um, important and, and critical role um, in, 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 in the success. Um, one, one is companion diagnostics, um, two is confirmatory studies and, and really harnessing patient voice um, um, and, and manufacturing consistency. And I think we sort of um, heard a little bit of elements um, earlier early on with, with others in, in, uh, on the panel. Um, with respect to, to companion diagnostics, um, you know, advances in, in personalized medicine have, have enabled us to um, really understand biology and environment to, to better predict successful outcomes. Um, and, and the success of personalized medicine really depends on, on, on accurate diagnostics um, that can help inform um, and ensure that patients are provided the right therapy at the right dose at the right time. Um, and, and industry could really benefit um, uh, um, that the, 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 the area more broadly could really um, benefit from greater clarity and predictability um, from, to, to allow for early investment decisions and, and developing companion diagnostics really as part of uh, uh, early decisions in, in development programs. And so, so there are opportunities to help clarify um, FDA's authority to regulate diagnostics um, so that industry and the agency could, could focus on you know, what is um, our risk-based framework going to look like? Um, you know, what, what, what the, the parameters of, 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 of flexibility um, so that we can focus really on standardizing test performance um, and focus on, on really, you know, locking in the accuracy of, of, of data. The, the second area is, is confirmatory studies. And, and, you know, as we know in this space that um, the, these therapies are, most therapies are, are, are evaluated based on limited data, which potentially raises some questions around safety and efficacy, and, and even as mentioned, um, you know, reimbursement policies. Um, and and um, as Heather was mentioning, you know, FDA's mission is, is certainly fundamental to protect and promote the, 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 um, the health of the American public. But also that mission includes promoting innovation, and especially where there is an unmet medical need. So, so, so that, and that leads to, you know, FDA making take tough decisions, even when the full scientific picture is, is incomplete, such as, you know, the ongoing health, uh, public health emergency. And, and through FDA's expedited pathways, 
um, there are opportunities to um, um, to for to to obtain approval based on limited data, um, surrogate or alternative markers um, 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 that 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 are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit um, conditioned on post approval confirmatory trials, and so to to ensure that that these these products on um, that that may be approved on you know a smaller amount of data. Um, um, are, are available as quickly as possible. Data generated from meaningful confirmatory studies, real-world evidence could help uh, be used to resolve doubt and confirm clinical benefit, um, and especially you know, patient-generated data, um, um, patient voice or uh, st stories from from colleagues, our colleagues today, could help us take a more directed view um, of, of folks who are who are really benefiting from um, what's what's currently available. But, but much work is needed to strengthen the program. Um, clear regulatory authority around confirmatory trials, for example, um, um, requiring that they've started or underway at the time of approval, um, more details around um, um, uh, th th those plans, and, and just generally greater transparency, transparency into the progress could, could be an advantage. The third is, is manufacturing consistency, and, and really um, um, a lot of my work um, it focuses on manufacturing related um, um, you know, matters, and it really, will, in my view, will be a key to the success of the growth and innovation of this, the space. Um, high cost manufacturing, slow turnaround time, sources of var variability are, are, are known areas, um, and, and one um, area that, um, you know, is, 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 is it could, could um, help to to um, shore up and and um, you know really allow us to to achieve the potential in this space is uh, advanced manufacturing technologies um, such as continuous manufacturing um, that can help to improve processes, advance drug quality, address shortages, and accelerate time to market. Um, and and while the technology does exist, and an FDA has initiated programs and issued guidance to help educate developers. Stakeholders have been slower to integrate these systems, and 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 in part um, because of high ca capital cost and and time associated with um, you know shutting down and retrofitting a manufacturing facility. So so opportunities for for additional incentives um, could help make progress. Um, designation programs that align with 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 tax benefits, um, user fee waivers or reductions, um, or, or generally. Um, you know, some sort of indication of less frequent inspections could help drive investments um, um, in, in advanced manufacturing technologies. Great, thanks so much, Lowell. And uh, we're fortunate that we're having this conversation um, at a time when Congress is moving to consider uh, the FDA um, user fee reauthorization. And I know that several of the points you touched on related to um, FDA, particularly in their resource needs, guidance development and areas where they focus on um, patient perspectives and cell and gene therapy development are, are already built into um, the, the commitment letter that's, that Congress is considering. So I think that um, hopefully some of those will be um, less of a, an immediate barrier and we can focus on other things. Um, Dr. Sherman, you've been really patient, um, but your company really was one of the first to um, enter into novel payment arrangements for cell and gene therapies. And so you, you can give us a really unique perspective on how they worked and you know, how sustainable they are for the future. Sure. Be here. Sure. Yeah, and thank you for pointing that out. You know, we're proud of being, you know, first movers there, but I actually think at some point when we go back and look at what we've done with Filgenzma and with uh, Luxurin and some of the other high cost therapies, the, the main benefit will be having shown proof of concept. These are rare conditions. We've shown we can do it. Everyone said before, no, these are long. Here, here's all the reasons you can't, and we've shown that we can. I think the financial impact um, that a lot of people look at is actually the least important piece. Um, you heard Lowell talk about how um, it's challenging for the FDA to look at things coming through accelerated approval, and that's true. Um, in, in many cases, not all cases, um, some of the things like hemophilia and sickle cell aren't that rare, sadly, but many things are. So when you're doing the clinical trials and trying to get things to market, it's hard to do them in a way that is, you know, the ideal of randomized control with large numbers, et cetera, and we look at biomarkers, and that creates uncertainty. And it would be easy as a payer to say, I don't believe the data, here's all the problems with it, which may be fair comments, but, and come back when you've done these um, 
to our to our liking and to our standards, but that ignores the fact that um, we're looking at conditions where there's unmet need, and frankly, we should want to see things come through the accelerated approval process. I'd much rather, and I say this as not as someone who works in the health line, but as a human being, as family members who've suffered from different diseases, I'd much rather see um, treatments for unmet need than another me too drug. So we need to understand that if we come back with, come, return when you have better data, return when you have five or 10 years worth of data, that sounds nice, but not if people are suffering. So we need ways to bring the drugs to market, but do it in a controlled setting. And for some, in, in some sense, what we're doing is actually recruiting these real world experiments. That's one way I explain it because we have engaged in risk agreements with manufacturers which allows us to um, you know, be more supportive in making these available. But in, in doing so, we're also spinning off real world, world evidence because we're making these drugs available through community physicians and patients and not ideal circumstances and in, in best um, of class well-controlled um, situations where the researchers and patients do exactly what they're supposed to, which doesn't happen in the real world. So I think that's also a benefit that sometimes isn't understood. Um, you heard Ashley talk about sickle cell disease. Um, so we, we will hopefully see a, a gene therapy for that in a few years and, and before that for hemophilia. Uh, that is terribly exciting in so many ways. And, and we want to see those, particularly for sickle cell where there are not good treatments. And, and again, Ashley explained some of the challenges far better than I could have having lived through it. But uh, you know, I, I, I do have the textbook version of that, even though I haven't had to I do that myself, and, and I thought that was very poignant. So we, we do want these to be made available. The issue is that these are also going to be um, a significant budget impact because there are a large number. So while what we did for some of the others was a nice to do, we really have to figure it out so that that price tag isn't a barrier. When you think about drugs coming to market and what the challenges are making them available, I think there's a couple that we're trying to solve for. One is coming up with a fair starting place, and I won't address today how you determine that, but it should be fair to the company that is, has developed the technology and the advances. Um, also to those paying for it, which includes state Medicaid agencies, which do have to balance their budget. So there's a number of questions, including the societal impact, what can we afford as a nation? Um, second, um, thinking about durability. There's often unknown durability and some of these may be price based and lifetime cure and you don't have a lifetime's worth of data. So we need to account for that. And then it's not always clear how the surrogate markers translate into what matters to the patient. So what we've tried to do is to come out with value-based agreements that tie some aspect of the price tag to um, basically demonstrating what the drug um, is supposed to have done based on the approval. And again, that, that's challenging, but we've been fortunate in, in that many of the pharma companies that we work with um, kind of get it. Um, it's one thing if you're talking about a drug for hundreds of thousands of people, antihypertensives, cholesterol lowering, um, other, and it, you know things can kind of average out. But when you're talking about things that may have a price tag of, of $2 million or more, um, it, it, and it, it's uncommon, it's kind of a binary event. So maybe it is worth $2 million when it works. And again, we could have a similar discussion on car keys if they work, but if they don't work, they're worth less and far less. So if those on the payer side are worried about that latter case, the question is how do we put together agreements that are fair for all and account for that? So we actually have done agreements where we are paying the, the, the full price and, and you know, there's different ways to do it in terms of paying as you go, et cetera, we paid up front. Um, and then part of the, that price is, um, is really at risk for the therapies um, doing what they're supposed to. And uh, we have actually agreements that got for five years. And to the extent that we can do more of these, um, that, you know, that will be really helpful. There are challenges. Um, in some cases, they are, you know, there is limited competition, so that the agreements may not as, be as robust as we'd like. There sometimes are disagreements over what the fair starting price is. And it can be challenging to collect the outcome measures. They're not all easy to collect, yet it's important to do so. And we do need to figure this out, particularly with therapies coming that will impact large numbers of individuals. Because if we can't figure it out, they're not going to get to the people who need them most. And that's kind of why we're all here. Absolutely. Well, it looks like um, Congressman Swalwell has joined us. So we're going to um, pause for a minute and, and hear from him. Um, I have the honor of introducing him uh, with Congressman Tom Emmer. He's uh, one of our, our greatest champions. Uh, for personalized medicine in the House of Representatives uh, through his joint leadership um, of the Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus. 
Uh, Representative Swalwell uh, was first elected to Congress in 2012 prior to serving in the House of Representatives. Um, he served on uh, the City Council for Dublin, California and spent seven years as a prosecutor after earning undergraduate and law degrees from the University of Maryland. He's now in his fourth term in Congress and he's proudly representing California's 15th Congressional District. Um, thanks so much for joining us today and the floor is all oh, yours. Of course, uh, thank you, uh, Cynthia, for stitching this group together. Uh, also, uh, I wanna thank uh, I know that Michael from Point32 Health and Ashley from Six Cells uh, helped us put this together today. Stephanie, nice to see you again, uh, as well as Lowell from uh, Hug Hogan Lovells. And uh, we're in the Judiciary Committee right now. We have Secretary Mayorkas uh, testifying, so I've uh, just stepped out uh, for that. But you know, our, our work continues, uh, and if anything, uh, COVID-19 uh, demonstrated to us that uh, we have uh, the ingenuity and, and the innovation and the minds in this country to take on uh, the greatest challenges. And, and so um, it really gives us an opportunity to, uh, I think, take on, you know, personalized medicine in, in the same way. And I have in my congressional district uh, 10x genomics. Uh, they're headquartered there. And they recently told me that had COVID-19 happened any year before uh, 2019, we would not have found a vaccine. Uh, within a year and so we really we got for we we're fortunate uh that it came when it did uh but as covid you know moves into the uh you know epidemic uh from pandemic uh we still know that 80 percent of rare diseases uh, today are genetic 70 percent begin in childhood uh, and that's why you know this coalition exists and that's why i've introduced with tom emmer uh hr 5989 the precision medicine answer for kids uh, Today Act, which would better diagnose and treat genetic disorders like cancer and rare diseases by making these tests more accessible. I also appreciate uh, that much of the conversation today has been around gene therapy and, and the future uh, of gene therapy. Um, personalized med medicine, as you know, is, is a rapidly advancing field uh, that is just rife with opportunity. And so combining the information that we have uh, today about a patient, particularly younger patients, uh, and their medical records while taking into account, you know, the determinants of health, as well as a patient's personal values, their personalized medicine allows the doctor, the patient, or the parents, and I have three kids in diapers and, and can, you know, sympathize with the role of parents play in this, to develop targeted treatment uh, and prevention plans. And so uh, this group, uh, you know, there's not a lot of issues in Washington that are bipartisan. Uh, Tom Emmer wakes up every day uh, work, working as the chair of the Republican Congressional Campaign Committee uh, to beat Democrats and, and put Republicans uh, in the majority. Uh, but uh, he has time uh, to work with me uh, on this important issue. And I think that uh, should give you all you know, just some hope that uh, while politics will always be a constant uh, in Washington, uh, that there are areas where uh, Republicans and Democrats can work together, but we need you. You are the glue uh, for us. And, and you've been you know, really helpful to Sarah on my staff as we think about what vehicles we can put this legislation in. You know, Cures 2.0 is, is one of them and, and we're working you know, through that and, and we've had success there. Uh, but you know, as we go into the appropriations season, also telling us what are your priorities uh, for us as far as what we can fund. So again, I, I just wanna thank you for uh, working with us so that we can tailor policies that you know, bring down the cost of healthcare uh, and allow patients to live uh, not just longer, uh, but healthier lives. Absolutely. And um, your relationship with um, Rep Representative Emmer and your staff's relationship really does give us a lot of hope um, that there are areas where, where Congress can come together to make meaningful differences in the lives of patients. So thank you so much. Of again. course, I'll let you continue and I'll get back uh, <laughs> Absolutely. into the arena. Good luck. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, it does seem like we solved the um, issue we were having earlier with our um, video remarks. So we're going to transition to that. And then uh, we will open the floor to audience Q&A. Um, so if you have questions, if you can type them in the Q&A box, um, we will ask them of the panelists. Um, so we'll start first with um, Congressman Tom Emmer's video. Um, we already did provide an introduction to him. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier, he is um, the co-chair on the uh, Republican side of the Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus. Good morning. Thank you for inviting me to join you today. And I want to especially thank Brian Kaufman for participating. It's wonderful to hear about the life-saving potential of this technology, and we are grateful for your leadership in this space. 
For those of you I don't know, I'm Tom Emmer. I have the privilege of representing Minnesota's 6th Congressional District here in Congress, and I'm also a co-chair of the Personalized Medicine Caucus, where our office works with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to further the understanding and usage of personalized medicine. As most of you know, personalized medicine, or as it is more recently referred to, precision medicine, is an emerging specialty which consists of some of the most cutting edge innovations in the medical field. Through personalized medicine, we can improve early detection, increase efficiency, and lower costs. Personalized medicine has the potential to save lives and revolutionize treatments, particularly when it comes to fighting deadly and costly diseases like cancer. We recognize the potential that personalized medicine holds for our future, which is why I've worked on legislation to bring pharmacogenomics testing to more patients. My Right Drug Dose Now Act, or the Right Act, which would address the barriers of implementing evidence-based PGX testing into routine clinical practice. The Right Act would require an assessment and update of the National Action Plan for Adverse Drug Event Prevention, create educational PGX campaigns targeted at the public and healthcare providers, and improve electronic health record systems to ensure proper reporting of adverse drug events and drug gene interactions. This is just one of the many initiatives we're working on in this space, and we look forward to collaborating with everyone to allow all patients to benefit from precision medicine tools. Thank you again to the Personalized Medicine Coalition for hosting this event today. I look forward to continuing our work together, and if I can ever be of service to you, please don't hesitate to reach out. Great. Um, our Republican co-chair, Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina, also recorded some thoughts um, specifically on the promise of cell and gene therapy. Um, he was the first to commit to joining um, as a co-chair of the Congressional Personalized Medicine Caucus, and um, the state of reason was because of the potential that he saw for um, gene therapy and advancing treatment for sickle cell disease. Um, he's really sorry that he couldn't join us today. Uh, but Senator Scott um, joined the Senate in 2013. He was elected to his first term in 2016. Um, among other committee assignments, uh, Senator Scott currently sits on the Senate Health Education, Labor and Pensions Committee, the Finance Committee, and the Special Committee on Aging. Um, previously, he served in the U.S. House of Representatives, uh, South Carolina's House of Representatives, and on the Charleston County Council. Um, if the technology gods are still with us, uh, we're going to hear his remarks now. Too often in Washington, conversations focus on problems without advancing solutions. That's part of the reason my good friend, Senator Sinema and I came together to form this bipartisan caucus to transform our healthcare landscape. FDA officials have suggested we could see 10 to 20 new cell and gene therapies approved every year by 2025. And there are hundreds in clinical trials as we speak. Take sickle cell disease, for example, an issue close to my heart. Sickle cell affects roughly 100,000 Americans, including around one in every 365 African-American births. It's an incredibly painful disease that can reduce both the quality and longevity of life. That's why I've worked on bipartisan legislation to ensure therapies currently in development, if approved, will be accessible to folks all across the country. It's also why I've fought to prevent government-run rationing and price controls like the ones in Speaker Pelosi's drug pricing bill, which could stop these cures from ever reaching America's patients. We've learned a one-size-fits-all approach does not work when it comes to Americans' healthcare needs. Through a personalized approach to medicine that harnesses American innovation, we are finding new opportunities to prevent, detect, and treat even the most debilitating diseases, and to do so faster and at a lower cost. Thank you all for your work on this important issue. Know that you can count on me to continue working with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance personalized healthcare solutions. Together, I'm confident we can move healthcare forward to better suit the needs of all Americans. I hope to see y'all in person real soon. God bless. Great. Um, so I would actually like to transition back to the, um, the panelists, um, if you can turn on your, your video and mics again. 
Um, and we have about a minute or two for each of you to share um, some final thoughts about um, additional work that you all believe needs to be done to make sure that the policy environments better align to support um, the pipeline that we're seeing of cell and gene therapies. Um, we heard that there's commitment from Congress to wanting to, to make these a reality for patients. Um, so what advice would you give them and their, their staff on what they can um, do to help? And uh, maybe we'll start with, with Mike. Yes, uh, thank you. So um, two things I would mention. Um, Number one, um, there are, are Medicaid best price regulations that where there's been some movement, but they're still viewed, um, not by me, because it's not my issue, but by the pharma companies as challenges to, um, you know, to, to coming up with more robust agreements. Um, second, um, there are issues related to port, essentially portability of agreements, which are complicated because health plans um, sometimes are inconsistent, as, as everyone knows, with respect to how we cover these. So to the extent that there are some sort of regs or guidance that promote consistency, I think that would also uh, support more robust agreements. Um, but beyond that, the most important thing we can do is not a regulatory um, issue. It's coming together as an, from different uh, portions of the industry to figure this out. Stephanie, is there anything you'd like to add? Absolutely. I would just add very quickly that payers should keep pace with innovation. Having worked at both CMS and a private payer, I can attest that sometimes change can be slow. And so if we keep innovation and patient access top of mind and focus on some solutions such as outpatient settings and different geograph geographic barriers, social determinants of health, then as long as we keep the patients um, at the center of what we do, then I think we'll all be driving towards the same goal. Thanks. Dr. Kaufman? First, again, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, and I would echo what uh, I heard uh, uh, from uh, the panelists around the table that I think it's going to be critically important and financially makes a lot of sense to uh, be involved involve patient reported outcomes. And real world data is a way to get some of these medications into the patients who need them uh, sooner. Um, in particular, in blood cancers, we know that for many of them, the only curative therapies are cellular therapies, namely a hemopoietic uh, stem cell or what's more commonly known as a bone marrow transplant. But these come with a significant mortality and morbidity because of the research in, the, in precision medicine and cell and gene therapy, CAR-Ts and other emerging gene therapies, especially if they can be managed outpatient are gonna represent a much safer and better option with the promise of a one and done therapy in the future. So we need to support these and allow them to get up, become more available to patients using real world data, patient reported outcomes to get them sooner into the patients who might benefit. Thanks. Thank you. Ashley? Yeah, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I would say some of my major takeaways is that um, I think Congress is really important in ensuring that the, these new types of models are built and that they work closely, it, it reflect what's needed in the patient population. Um, you know, there's an important role for Congress to be the conveners of the public. We've never done this before, the various healthcare systems and models and, and hospitals and providers and payers who are all responsible for administering care. We, we've not dealt with curative therapies before. So much as my colleagues have mentioned today, how are we going to incorporate real world data and quantified patient voices to de develop measures um, and why this is so important. If we look at sickle cell as the, as the model, as one of the diseases to get a cure soon, over 50% of the sickle cell population uses Medicaid as their primary payer. And for, and you know, it's hard to keep a job. It's hard to have commercial payers when you have a disease like this. So understanding that over the majority, that the majority of our population is a beneficiary of Medicaid, this is an issue that just impacts, you know, employer groups or private payers. This is going to impact state healthcare systems and state and federal budgets. And understanding that the previous models have left this community disenfranchised and feeling vulnerable. So, you know, I really, I've said it a few times, this is an opportunity, but we do need to move swiftly because, you know, the cures are here. They'll be here this yep. year. They'll be here next year. So we do need to, to act quickly and together. We all feel that same sense of urgency. And Lowell, is there anything you want to add for the final word? 
Sure, and just just to echo and, and appreciate um, from colleagues' insights that there's just tremendous opportunity um, in the cell and gene therapy space. And as Ashley just mentioned, I mean, it's very much here and very much within reach. Um, and, and I and I appreciate the discussion and and sort of reflection of sort of how we translate really scientific advances into practical approaches. Um, and and one you know one one area as I mentioned earlier in terms of you know, sustaining and building infrastructure, uh, ensuring, um, you know, necessary resources are, are available to um, review and help um, facilitate um, developers and, and um, innovative medicine um, get through the review process um, and, and ultimately to market as we learned, you know, this the past two years um, and, and, and before, but um, that, that that approval of vaccines doesn't doesn't mean vac that doesn't necessarily result in in, in vaccination. Um, and so, um, as the colleagues here have been sort of talking about, you know, holistically connecting the dots of um, public health agencies to make sure that um, drugs that get through FDA um, are also ultimately um, available um, to to patients includes um, other you know public health stakeholders. Um, and so it's it's as part of putting together patient voice and, and real world data. It's it's um, um, you know also part of this sort of real world value proposition um, to help um, um, make sure that that we have access to these innovative transformative medicines. Right. And thank you all for this terrific discussion. We're sorry that it did run a few minutes over because of our technology challenges. Uh, but I would like to answer um, one of the most important questions. The recording will be sent out. Uh, to all registered attendees and be posted um, on the Personalized Medicine Coalition website as well. Um, but thank you to all the panelists for your preparation and your patience in bringing this program together. Um, I would also like to close with thanking my PMC colleagues, David Davenport um, and Chris Wells for their coordination on this program. It, you did a terrific job. So thank you so much for making it possible. And we hope you all have a great day. Great, thank you.